Welcome to this um, session uh, called Are You Staying Safe and Well? Uh, about mental well-being in the TV industry during COVID-19 and beyond, hosted by the RTS and the film and TV charity. My name is Paul Robinson. I'll be chairing this for the next hour. And um, the sort of topics we're going to discuss are things like uh, what are the challenges being faced by people working in TV, especially freelancers? And we're going to discuss mental and financial well-being, uh, how to maintain connections to uh, replace physical connections and how to foster an industry community, how to make the best use of your time, skills, experiencing, experiences, and also preparing for the return to work, hopefully, and then what changes may be needed in the sector to ensure that working in TV remains a viable option in the longer term. So that's our basic menu. We have one hour together. Uh, we'll use the Q&A window in Zoom, so please do send in your questions at any time. If you want to put your name to your question, that's fine. If you want to be anonymous, that's also fine. Um, you don't have to present the question yourself, don't worry, we'll read those questions out. So if you have got questions, I'd urge you to use that Q&A button uh, and then we'll look at those questions and we'll uh, stop at various points to include your questions. So please do use the Q&A. We're also recording the debate and we'd obviously appreciate your feedback too. We know there may be follow-ups needed and we'd love to know what you think about this particular session. So all feedback, um, positive and critical, uh, very, very welcome. So let me start then by introducing uh, the panelists. And uh, we're delighted to have Alex Pomfrey, the CEO of the film and TV charity here. Uh, Lisa Opie, the managing director of UK production for BBC Studios. Philippa Childs, the head of Beck2, uh, Kelly Wem Lam, the Deputy Director of Programmes for Channel 4. And we've also got um, Charlie here, Charlie McMorris, who's an RTS bursary student, um, and he's going to get his results on July the 1st. So we're wishing Charlie all the very best, Charlie. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you get some good numbers and good results on July the 1st. So we're going to start, though, with a presentation, which um, I think will set the context for this. Um, and it's full of some very useful ideas. So let me hand over to Alex Pumphrey. And Alex, the floor is yours. And I think you can share the screen and we can see your slides. So over to you. Super. Thank you very much, Paul. And welcome, everyone. It's nice to, I can't see you, I'm afraid, but I know you're all there. Um, I'm just going to, before I go to the slides, I just want to start with a few facts and figures so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, there are... 180,000 people who work in television and film within the UK industry and around 100,000 of those are freelancers so just half of our industry workforce works freelance so they really are the lifeblood of, of everything we do and everything we create in our commercial success. Amongst those freelancers we, we now know um, that they split roughly a third, a third, a third into the following categories so um, around a third of them operate as sole traders, which is what uh, Treasury is deemed to be self-employed. Um, around a third operate as one-person limited companies, and the other third operate as what's known typically within the industry, many of you will know, as PAYE freelancers. So those who will hop from short-term contract to short-term contract operating on a PAYE basis. That way of working, we've discovered is, is obviously very important for the ways in which people have or haven't been able to access government support through COVID-19 and we'll come back to that which is why I wanted to set the scene with it. Um, some research we did at the very end of March beginning of April showed that probably three quarters of uh, freelancers working within the television sector were unable to access the government employment and self-employment support schemes and so that's, that's the scene if you like for what we're all experiencing now. Um, so I am going to share a screen. I hope that's come up for you all now. Um, what I wanted to take you through today oops, was just really some stimulus for the debate that will follow and all the other panelists will um, amplify, challenge some of the points that I want to make. Um, 
the film and TV charity, for those of you who perhaps don't know us, are with a charity that supports people working in the film and television sector. Uh, we've been doing that for nearly 100 years, but in the last couple of years, we've been on a big transformation um, to make ourselves much more relevant uh, to the sector as it is today and to the pressures facing people today. And last year, we launched a major new programme of work around mental health, which I hope you've heard of, it comes under the title of the whole picture programme. And the research that underpinned that programme is the Looking Glass, which was a survey that was completed by nearly 10,000 people working within the sector. And really, we had an outpouring um, of views, experiences, and emotions throughout the research process. So even before COVID-19 hit, we knew just how vulnerable our workforce within the sector was, um, specifically in terms of their mental health nearly nine in ten people working in the sector have experienced mental health problems and so we often say you, you can assume that just about anyone you meet working within this industry has experienced a mental health problem in their lifetime that is very significantly higher than the uk population as a whole where the equivalent figure is 65 percent so there is much higher prevalence of mental health problems for people working within film and television and a lot of our work which i'm not going to go into in depth now has been about understanding why that is and being able to tackle the underlying causes of those really poor mental health outcomes. There are some even more difficult um, statistics that, that have come from that research. We know that more than half of people working within the industry have considered taking their own life and actually um, a, a much higher than average proportion of people who've taken steps to end their own life, which is, which is horrifying trying to find the reasons for those mental health outcomes things that really come to the fore are people not feeling valued the words disposable and expendable were the words that came up most often when people described how they felt about themselves and working in the sector um lack of control of working hours is a really important determinant of mental health outcomes interestingly it's not the hours per se that are worked it's the control you have over those hours and those times when you can't get get away to have the family dinner or meet your friends down the pub or get to the parent teacher meeting um none of that's happening at the moment obviously but those were the things that we found last year that were impacting mental health and bullying um and certainly our research sort of disappointingly found that that bullying is still incredibly prevalent within the culture of the industry we knew all of that before COVID um, and that if you like sets the scene, scene and was our concern as the COVID crisis hit and of course by the 24th of March uh, lockdown was in effect and all but essential production by that point had stopped. Um, research done across the UK has shown um, a huge spike in anxiety and depression around about the 24th of March which receded a little bit uh, afterwards, but has remained about 40% higher than it has been on average. So that's the world that we're, that we're all in and we're all experiencing at the moment. And um, the survey we did at the very end of March, uh, beginning of April showed that at that point, 93% of freelancers within our industry were out of work. So a small fraction were working, um, but the vast majority were not. And that, as I mentioned, three quarters of them were not eligible for the government support. So I think the challenge for all of us, um, as we now begin to look forward to how we recover from COVID-19, is how we can put both people's physical, and, but also their mental well-being in a holistic sense, at the heart of our plans for the recovery and rebuilding of our industry. Um, this is a little bit of a look back to what's happened for us at the charity uh, over the past couple of months. We, our film and TV support line is a confidential 24-7 um, support line that's been running for the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, without needing to look at the scale on this chart, you can see what happened to the number of calls we received. Um, this was sort of before lockdown took effect when we had as many calls in three days as we'd normally expect to get in three months. And that was, that was certainly to do with people's um, emotional state and their anxiety about what was happening. It was also very much to do with their financial state. So people who were losing work or who were coming back into the market after the winter break, trying to find work and then realizing that that work was simply not going to be there. Um, we worked 
in partnership with BFI and catalyzed by a, a, a huge donation from Netflix, um, which was then complemented by BBC, BBC Studios, Sky um, and Warner Media to create an emergency relief fund that was rolled out in April. Um, and that was targeted to those who were most vulnerable and who uh, were, were struggling to meet basic living costs over a three month period. So I'm talking about people who you know, weren't gonna be able to pay the rent um, or, or pay the grocery bill in that period. And we delivered 3.15 million of financial aid to those individuals who were falling outside of the government support schemes. What we're doing now is looking at how we can provide holistic support of our industry community and um, both of those ideas, I think, are really important. This idea of holistic support. We know that well-being is multifaceted. It is to do with your financial well-being. It's to do with your social well-being. Um, it's to do with uh, your, your mental health. And all of those things combine to create a well or a, a not so well um, individual. So we continue to provide financial support and financial advice. Um, we have been um, providing some very bespoke mental health um, support, which we've developed in conjunction with MIND. And we've um, added to the services on the support line. So the support line can be a listening ear if you want to phone up for an hour and chat about a, a, you know, a bad day you've had, that's fine. But it can also put you through to some really great services, including video therapy, um, online CBT counselling, and um, sadly also we've, we've added in bereavement counselling as well for people. This idea of community and connections, um, we feel is really important. There's been, I think it would be fair to say, a, a lack of sense of community in the industry, or that sort of dissipated over in, in recent history. And that leaves people, and I think particularly that freelance workforce, tending to feel very alone adrift and I know you know a number of it said to us in the early days of this crisis abandoned by the industry and I think that is it's not just a great sadness we need we need those people to be um, engaged as an industry we need them to be contributing and we obviously want them to be there for when we do return to work so we're really keen on this idea of rebuilding a sense of our industry community of looking out for one another um, and enabling people to support uh, their, 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 their friends and, and colleagues within the industry. And that's certainly part of what we want to do as well at the charity. And then the final strand is about purpose and productivity, which is, you know, as I've said, a large proportion of people are not working, making sure that those people are enabled and have the right resources um, uh, available to them to use that time well. And certainly the things we've been doing are not exhaustive. There's a lot more going on out there in the industry that is helping people to do that. But we are very quickly looking forward to how we can support people through and out of this crisis. And this is where I think we need to, as an industry, be taking a more uh, collaborative, collective and strategic approach to what we need to do. Um, the framework on this slide is, I'm not going to walk through it, there's a lot of information on it. It's adapted by um, a man called Sandra Galea, Professor Sandra Galea, who works out of the university of Boston and he's a professor of public health who has analysed uh, responses to typically natural disasters and obviously this pandemic is a little bit different to that in the way it, it unfolds. But he found that there were these different stages um, that people, society, businesses go through as they respond to these disasters and we've, if you like, translated that for our industry and for the current situation with COVID-19. Um, so we know that the initial phase is one of, of shock, um, of trying to meet your basic needs, and that's kind of the emergency response phase. There's then a sort of digging in phase where you're surviving, and if you can optimise, then you're certainly surviving before you move into recovery and how you rebuild the industry. And I think a couple of things that are really important to realise about this is I think where individuals are, and where the industry at a corporate level is, is not always perfectly in step. So I think what we hear as a charity is that a lot of individuals are, you know, probably in stage two in that preservation mode, um, whereas the industry is looking ahead to how we can rebuild, recover and really get back to work. 
and so sometimes you get a sort of misalignment of, of priorities going on it's also not a linear process so you can go forwards and then and then back in this in this journey as well um, so it's a little it's a little bit, bit like stages of grief that, that you will have heard of and one thing through all of this that I'm really keen we can pay some attention to in the debate today is our rising concern about the risk of loss of talent uh, that comes through this and particularly for um, diversity within our industry and the younger and more diverse members of our workforce. So it's, it's great we've got Charlie with us. I look forward to hearing his views. It's very clear now that underrepresented groups are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 within the general population that it's also going to be true within our industry. Um, they are less likely to have the financial resilience to weather this storm and as I've already said a number of them will have been out of work for a significant period of time already. I know many individual stories of people who've already given up and walked away. Um, there is a, also a long history of recessions tending to take us backwards on diversity. Uh, there's data from Directors UK that shows that 8% of female directors uh, left the industry after the 2008 recession. So I think this is really where our focus needs to be now as we look towards recovery, um, towards how we support in a really holistic sense the mental health, but also just the, the, the financial well-being of our diverse workforce to make sure that we can consider diversity, inclusion, amplification of a wider range of voices and make sure that's, that's really hard-baked into our recovery strategy. Alex, I'll jump in there. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. What a great presentation. And I think uh, uh, some quite um, uh, shocking and illuminating numbers, particularly on your first slide, that you've sensitive people who've experienced mental health problems and consider taking their own lives. And given that's pre-COVID-19, those are, are shockingly high numbers. I was, I was uh, really, um, uh, really quite disturbed by that. Let me um, just slightly change the plan. I'm going to come to Philippa first, and we'll come to you, Lisa and uh, Kelly, in a moment. But Philippa, if we can just get your reaction, can I ask you to keep your comments fairly short because we've got a lot to get through and we're running a little bit behind. So, Philippa, just uh, headlines. You know, re your reaction to the uh, the presentation from Alex. Sure. Well, yes, it is shocking, um, but I can't say that I'm surprised by those findings. Um, unfortunately, uh, we know that uh, there are there were real problems prior to COVID-19, and we all know that those problems can only uh, are only going to be exacerbated in the current situation. So, we've had the um, as as Alex has described, we've had the trauma of, for people of not being able to get any financial. Um, support during this period. Um, from our research, lots of people have had to rely on um, loans, uh, borrowing from family, they've lost their homes, they've lost, you know, everything that's dear to them really it's as a result of this because they simply haven't had the financial support that they had hoped for and, and, and have a right to expect. So, um, we are very concerned that uh, that trauma will continue. So as well as people worrying about the physical return to work, they're also going to be very anxious about that. Uh, they need to return to work because they need to get some income, but a combination of the, the, the trauma that they've experienced and the, the physical, you know, everybody's got different anxieties about, about, you know, what returning to work. So I think we really worry about um, this next stage where people are physically returning to work, but also dealing with, um, you know, what they've had, had to deal with over the last uh, few months. And uh, is that enough for now? Great, that's fantastic. I think you've set up returning to work beautifully and we will return to that later in the hour. So thank you, that's wonderful. Let me turn to you, Lisa, representing BBC Studios. Um, I, I, I think that was very sobering um, from Alex uh, and, uh, and clearly we really, really support the film and TV charity and have done so um, as practically as we can. Um, I think it's been an incredibly difficult 10 or 12 weeks. I've lost count of how many weeks I've been sitting in my front room. Um, and, and I think there is, you know, a real risk that the people who are the life 
part of our industry um, find this industry increasingly hard working and are finding it very hard to work in now, obviously. Um, and I think that would be, I'd hate to feel that we stepped backwards in terms of the diversity that we can attract, of people that we can attract into our industry. It's so important that we don't move backwards. Um, so I think there is, there is a moment when all of us need to think collectively about what next and how we move forward to protect what we do, what we do so incredibly well and so successfully. I think, you know, what I have been really encouraged by is that I have actually seen more collaboration, more joined up thought across our industry than I've ever witnessed before. I've had regular meetings with ICP studios, regular meetings with other broadcasters and, and, and you know, with Beck2, with everyone else to, to, to begin to say, how do we return to work safely and constructively in a way that our employees feel um, protected and feel safe going forward and we have collaborated to come up with um, the guidelines that we think and hope inform the way that we work going forward and as, uh, as an industry I think have joined up to lobby for the support that we believe we need in order to return swiftly into work so I think there's this I'm, I'm encouraged by that collaboration that's happened and see and beginning to see a way through to Alex's point about we're all on a curve going upwards to greater collaboration greater innovation and and hopefully our industry starting up again I think there are longer term issues that all of this has brought up and highlighted that we as an industry will need to still confront um, but but it's about you know which ones you deal with first Okay, no, fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. That's very succinct and very clear. Kelly um, Webb Lamb, um, what's your point of view from Channel 4? Uh, well, I honestly support everything that Philippa and Lisa have just said. I, I think, you know, the slides that Alex showed are sobering and upsetting, but I agree that they're unfortunately not surprising. And we are in an industry that is sort of built on insecurity and freelancers work from project to project. And that in itself is a very difficult way to work and has always meant um, that certain people are better and easier able to access the industry than others. Um, and I think that the positive thing about this situation with COVID for us as an industry is it has shone a light on all of those things that have always been there, I suppose, but it's given us a moment of, of exactly as Lisa said, of sort of coming together across broadcasters, but also across the industry um, to think, to work together, to think about how we can tackle some of these things. Um, and also to listen and to have time to talk. And I think those things are positive. I also think, this isn't in Alex's slide, but I have certainly felt that some of the, uh, it, we work in a very informal industry and the informality of the industry is not always a good thing and it doesn't help um, people to get ahead and to, reach their ambitions and their goals because it's so much based on who you know and there's been something about the fact that that informality has just gone as a result of this virus because we are all now talking to each other like this and you can't go to breakfast or lunch or for drinks that actually there's something about that that's been good and we certainly at Channel 4, there's been a lot of work on access to commissioners over this time and making sure that we're working with um, Screen Skills and with Alex and with across the other broadcasters. Uh, and I think that we need to take some of the sort of unforeseen things about the way that we've had to work through this crisis forward that have been positive. I also think that, you know, there has been an enormous amount of work across the broadcasters and across the indies into how we can get people back to work now um, and how we can get people back to work safely and what that actually means. And that is a positive thing and has meant that there's been collaboration when normally there might not be. Um, so, 
look, I think it's a, unfortunately, these things aren't new, um, but if we can, and I think we've already shown that we can use the situation for a bit of a catalyst for change, that's a way forward. That, that's a great line, catalyst for change. I think that's a very great way to end your initial comments. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that's very helpful, Kelly. Let me just bring um, in uh, Charlie briefly. Charlie, you're expecting to get your results uh, 1st of July and, and you want to work in this business. What's your reaction briefly to what? Well, um, Charlie, are you there? Yeah, sorry, you froze no, no, Um, Like, the figures that were shown on the first slide reiterate and what's been uh, said before me, it's shocking, but it's not surprising. Um, coming straight out of uni, so many people I've seen have just said how stressful this final year is, and we're looking forward to the break after handing in their last assignment, having a break, then making their way into the industry. But what's happened now, it's put everyone back into a worse state of mental well-being because for us as graduates, we don't know when it will be that we can make our break into the industry. We don't know where the industry is at the moment. We know it's in lockdown, but we don't know how to move forward with it because this isn't something that we've been taught about at university. We've been taught about networking and how to be a good freelancer and how to use the industry and social medias like LinkedIn to make connections because as it was said before me, unfortunately with the industry, it's about who you know. But right now we're, we're stuck in a state where we, we don't know what to do. And reiterating what Kelly said, the industry has been really supportive in that. I've seen countless amounts of people from networks like BBC, ITV, Channel 4, just reaching out to people like myself on LinkedIn, just offering just an, an ear, just for us to speak to and vocalize our insecurities about breaking into the industry. And I think despite this being such a challenging time for us as students, it's something that has got a silver line into it where we are making those connections on a personal, but also a professional level with people that otherwise we might not have been able to. Okay, fantastic. And Charlie, just very quickly, one word answer. You're still keen to get into the industry? Yeah, of course. Okay, that, that's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Let's uh, move into our next section then. Um, we would like your questions, by the way. Um, if you'd like to put a question, please don't feel shy. Uh, if you want to be anonymous, it's totally fine to do that. We do understand. We haven't got to read your question out. It's nothing scary. Uh, just put your um, question into the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen in the Q&A section and we'll uh, take your questions a bit later. Let's move into the next section then. We're going to talk about the four main sort of areas identified in Alex's presentation there. So financial well-being, mental health, community, and productivity and purpose. So let's start with um, financial well-being. And obviously, um, as we heard, um, financial challenges are very, very significant indeed. Um, Lisa, let me come to you first. Um, how, how would you advise uh, freelancers to cope with the financial challenges that have now been put in front of them as a result of COVID-19? I mean, I, I think it's, it's incredibly difficult. I think I would say that I think we will be returning to work. Um, I would say that I don't think that there's a sort of been a perception that maybe everything would be easier and cheaper to deliver and um, there would be less people involved. I think in the short term that may be the case, but in the longer term, I think we have reasons to believe that the production sector will continue to be vibrant and the demand for what we do will exist. So, uh, you know, I, I can see it beginning. We, we paused 82 different productions back in March. We've continued to deliver about 28. That's not actually that bad. And we're now beginning to see things move forward. So I would say hold the faith. I do think that we will return to production, not as fast as I'd like, but we will. Um, I think, you know, we as a company um, have wanted to support the sector as much as we could and we're proud of what we've been able to do with the film and television charity. We're proud of what we've been able to do, especially with our PAYE paying 
freelancers and our fixed term contractors who we have enabled um, to access the support mechanisms that we have across studios but I know that furloughing has been a real challenge um, and it has been for us just working through the sheer volume of people who we have regularly worked with and who we genuinely feel a connection to and care about. I know that's been a challenge. Um, so I think, you know, from a financial perspective, everybody, what I've learned is that everybody um, is very different and, and um, you know, we've had different contractual relationships with an awful lot of people who we regularly employ. Um, and for each of them, there has been a different scenario. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's about continuing to hold the faith about coming back and hoping that you can. Um, it's about adaptive adaptability we are driving innovation and we're beginning to see that in the way we work and that's not a that's not a bad thing i think it'll be good for our industry and in, in, for the most part in what we're learning along the way in production um and i think this is still a sector that we want people to want to work in um so Nick, do you think sure Lisa, how... there's any advice, sorry to interrupt you do you think there's any advice to be given in terms of how you structure yourself alex explained the the third a third a third uh, one third are sole traders, one third are single person limited companies, and one third are PAYE freelancers. Um, given the treasuries recognise the first but not the last two, are there any lessons there in terms of how you structure yourself as a freelancer? God forbid we never have COVID-19 again, but in terms of thinking about financial security, are some ways better than others? So I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, I think there are lessons for us as an industry. We have worked within a structure that has um, had people work as freelancers and, and they have moved from job to job on very short term engagements. And that has worked previously because it gave them the flexibility they wanted and it was impacted in their tax status. So for all the reasons that there have been historically, we have found ourselves with that mix of employment contract for the people who work within our sector going forward uh, given what we have learned over the last few months is that the right shape i think that's a question we all need to collectively ask ourselves um because there have been you know we we, are, we find ourselves where we are for a combination of reasons and that's not all been about how an employer structures a contract it has been about how employees and how, how freelancers have wanted to move within the industry so i think I don't know what those answers are now and today, but I do know that's something we're going to have to ask ourselves as an industry if we want to continue to encourage people to work with us. Um, and as we said at the front, if we want a diverse workforce, we are really going to have to address it as a sector. Sure, let's come to diversity later because that's very, very important. Um, Kelly, just on this issue about um, people suffering financially, are we at risk of losing good people out of the business because they can't afford to work and they're going to go and do something else and then they won't come back? Um, I fear that we are and really hope that we're not. Um, I think, you know, we are as a country facing a really terrible economic situation and I'm sure as an industry we're not alone in struggling with that. I think from a from a channel four perspective, look, the, the you know, the financial reality here is that this year has been really, really challenging for us. Um, and we are, you know, we are a channel that doesn't have a guaranteed income. Our income comes from advertising and um, we lost hundreds of hours of content overnight and have taken a 150 million pound cut to our content budget along with huge cuts across the rest of the channel. Um, and I guess our, the best thing, you know, we've also had to draw down, as I'm sure you all know, on 70 million pounds of, 75 million pounds of borrowing. So we faced a pretty stark year. The, from from our perspective the very best thing that we can continue to do for freelancers and for the industry is to continue to commission and so you know our attitude to this year has been to ensure that despite the challenges that we're facing that we've kind of ring fence money to continue to commission this year 
we ring fenced a significant development pot because certainly during it's changing a bit now because I think it is becoming easier to actually go back into production but during the time when it wasn't to make sure that people could work in development um, but it isn't going to for us suddenly go back to normal it will be a how long, how long will it take how long will it take Kelly to get back to normal do you think I mean <laughs> I'm sorry that's a terrible question to ask but I have to ask you I mean, I, the, the truth is none of us knows what's going to happen with this virus do we and we don't know what's going to happen with the economy so we are working on the basis of this year and looking into next year and I think what we have to do is continue to commission and that does mean that we are commissioning at lower tariffs than we were um, but we are commissioning uh, and getting people into work and we have commissions you know we've commissioned a lot of shows through lockdown and we're now looking at commissioning shows coming out of lockdown um, and we've just got to be realistic and honest about it and yeah. we're doing you know the the we've put together a freelance uh, kind of support package that we're doing through this time um, but we're not in a position where we have a guaranteed income and so the financial pressures on the industry are there and they are real um, and I think we've just the most important thing is that there's transparency and honesty about that so that we can all we can have honest conversations with producers about what we're expecting for the, the shows that we're commissioning on different tariffs to what they were. Sure, sure. I understand. Um, no, no, thank you. Let, let, me, let me stop you there just to make sure we, we do cover the topics. We've got lots to try and get to that look really, really helpful. And you make the point about advertising very, very clearly. And obviously that's going to affect you and ITV and Channel 5. And obviously the BBC is, is uh, not immune, uh, but obviously not affected by advertising. Um, Philippa Childs from Back2, are you concerned there'll be fewer freelance jobs this year and maybe even going into 2021? Uh, yes, yes, of course, we, we are concerned because um, quite clearly the return to work pro protocols mean that things are going to take longer, there are going to be less people on set and so on. Um, so, so yeah, I'm worried about that, but I'm also um, worried about... Um, uh, so I actually agree with Lisa that we need to be thinking about um, what needs to change in terms of freelancer engagement what you collectively we've sort of failed to put to to explain to the government the ways that, that the industry engages uh, its workforce and we have failed collectively much as it grieves me to um persuade them to do something during this period so if to, to my mind we've therefore got a collective responsibility to think about what that workforce how we engage that workforce going forward and what, if anything, we can put in place to um, to cushion them against any you know future situation like this? And I'm not saying it's easy because I absolutely recognise the financial challenges and you know the fact that that um, this crisis has has impacted the broadcasters and everyone in the industry. But I th there is a great deal of anger out there uh, from, from the workforce, the freelance workforce. And I, I simply don't think that you are going to retain the, the, the industry is going to retain the talent and um, the workforce that they want and will need in the future, unless some tangible things do change. So we, we, I don't have any answers about that but we are definitely thinking about what should change in the industry what should be different structurally and what we we are we might be asking the industry to do okay so that, that's going to be a, a hot topic and that's going to be debated and discussed for a while and it sounds like the good thing is everyone's going to do it together because actually everyone's been saying a similar thing and i think as i think as lisa mentioned what's happened is people have come together and there's more um, talking and there's more collaboration which obviously has to be uh, very good for all of us particularly for the freelancers let's move on to uh, mental health advice and uh, let me stick with you if I may um, Philip and ask you what can you do to help to keep yourself uh, mentally healthy 
during during this period uh, or period, yes. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think one of the positives, one of the huge positives uh, during this period is the whole industry has um, been thinking about what it, what it can offer to, to freelancers who are out of work at, at this time. Uh, I know Screen Skills have been doing lots of work. We've been doing lots of training and providing lots of opportunities for our members to contribute um, their thoughts and ideas about the return to work. So I guess uh, keeping people busy is quite important. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you, you can't get away from the fact that if you're facing huge financial challenges, the chances are that is going to be uppermost in your mind. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, promising that the, the industry is returning to work. Um, I just think we, meet, we need to make sure that we look after, as I said earlier, people's mental health as, as um, we start to, to do that. Okay. Uh, Lisa from the BBC, what advice have you been giving to BBC freelancers on mental health and keeping mentally healthy during this time? So I think we have felt very strongly as a as a company, but um, as BBC Studios, that um, people are the lifeblood of everything that we do, and and we have uh, worked really hard and and were in the run up to this crisis, thinking very hard about how um, we supported our staff um, and how we we looked after their um, mental well and physical well being more effectively. So we had prior to this put in place. A lot of support that, that that we hadn't previously had from you know access to online doctors to um, an, an organization called Sanctus who provides mental health counseling to people individually we as soon as this happened made our employer assistance program available to um, our freelance staff our PAYE paying freelance staff as well and um, so we have done as much as we possibly can and uh, also health and exercise classes as well from a, a brilliant guy called Jack Green who's been providing that on a daily basis we're hugely aware that it's very difficult um, it's difficult with staff not to mention with freelance staff to engage and and you know do what you would normally do in connecting with people and making them feel as if they're part of a um a com you know a community it's already challenging and you also don't know what people's lifestyles are like whether they've got three children at home or partners who are also trying to work whether they live in a one bedroom flat or a five bedroom house you have no idea so all of those things make um engagement really quite challenging and difficult so we have been putting a real emphasis on it um and uh because we believe that it's really important to to the teams that we work with um, and we've extended that as far as we possibly can into the industry Kelly um, from Channel 4, um, obviously um, we should differentiate here between those who are uh, normally uh, in a pretty good place mentally and those who have uh, maybe ongoing mental health problems for whom this may have exacerbated uh, how they feel and, and made things worse for them. How can you uh, help people, both those who are relatively mentally health fit and those who we know may be um, having more difficulty? Kelly. So I think, like Lisa, for us, there's, we've been dealing with supporting our staff and then also doing what we can to support beyond into the industry. Um, and I think there are sort of a number of things. And what we've tried to do is to engage, to kind of listen and actively participate as much as we possibly can with the kind of groups out there that support freelancers. Um, and to use this time to um, try and participate as much as we can in keeping people busy and active in terms of training, in terms of access to commissioners. We've been doing webinars. Um, we've been doing briefings as much as we can. We've had ideas factories. We've done talks and masterpieces. So we've tried to sort of give people support in that way as we can as a broadcaster to in effect use the fact that everything has slowed down as an opportunity to increase access to commissioners, which I think is one of the things um, for freelancers that it feels like you've got broadcasters and then indies and producers, and then you've got freelancers. And so we've tried to sort of use this as an opportunity to change those relationships. At the same time as that, we've obviously done, 
had to do and have done a lot of work with our own staff. Um, exactly as Lisa said, was kind of trying to keep people engaged, making sure that everyone's okay. People have got very different challenges at home. Um, and we've tried to sort of flex the way that we work to, um, to, to respond to that. But I do think one of the things in Alex's slides that we haven't touched on yet, but when with mental health that is really important is the conversation around kind of bullying and how we treat people in the industry. And I do feel that this is, uh, we sh is a time when we just have to collectively come together and sort of really have zero tolerance going forward for that and make sure that we use the fact that we have worked together in a different way through this time, that there has been collaboration, that there has been conversations like this, um, and that we are all doing work with Alex, we are all doing work with screen skills, um, to really make sure that we focus on just eradicating that and not standing for it anymore because I think if we there are some things that we can really tackle they are in our hands and the sort of freelance insecure nature of the industry is a much 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 harder thing to do than to just say to tackle than to than to tackle the way that people behave and yeah. so it feels to me you know there are multiple fronts that we need to work on and actually um, it, it, we are seeing that we are we we have been able to use this time in this crisis to kind of focus on some of those things and we just need to make sure that we keep that going as the industry gets back to work okay no very, very good thank, thank you kelly i mean let me turn to you alex um i want to talk about um, community and connections in a moment but just on this bullying issue um the extent of bullying, I think, is quite quite shocking. Why is our industry maybe worse than other industries? Um, there's quite a complex web of stuff that goes on that lends itself to some of these behaviours. So it's partly cultural. Um, it's partly to do with the culture that exists within our industry. We hear a lot about a culture of toughness, about people earning their stripes, badge of honour. These are all phrases that get repeated. And so this idea that you that that you should tough it out when you're being badly treated is very commonplace. Um, some of it is clearly structural because of the freelance nature of the way in which so many people work. So if you're faced with bad behaviour, you know, and you've got another week or two weeks left on a project, are you going to stick your head down and go, I'll just, you know, I'll just last until the end and then hope that the next project's better and I'm not going to kick up a fuss because the person I would report this incident to is the person I would be going back to for my next job. Um, so these factors all combine to lend themselves to what we see and part of the work we're doing and it's, it's um, you know, we, we, we work a lot with, with Philippa and Beck too, and it's fully supported by both BBC, BBC Studios, Studios and Channel 4 is the whole picture programme, which is a two year programme, which is supported by Mind Mental Health Charity. And it is designed to address some of those underlying causes. So they're really knotty. You know, you, you can't change the culture of the industry overnight. You can't change behaviours overnight. We need a really sustained long term and well thought through and collaborate. You know, I think the key Key word that's come out of the discussion so far is a collaborative coordinated response to some of these because with the best will in the world no one organization is going to change the way the industry behaves we need to do this together um, and that's the spirit of the whole pitch program is to look at how we what practical things we can do um, and that you know i won't go into them but there are some really practical things you can do to to, to to influence behaviour, to provide people with roots of support if they're being bullied, to provide them with advice, guidance, um, to create reporting systems. So those are all things that we are looking at together. And I just wanted to echo what Kelly said earlier, which is, you know, there, I think there is a catalyst for change here in a very positive sense. I think it needs real work and commitment. It's not just going to happen by us all sort of saying the right thing on, on sessions like this. I think it requires the real work to be done but I think actually there is a fantastic opportunity and this little bit of breathing space in an odd way that this current time has given us is allowing us to reflect on that, to have these conversations with the freelance community and the wider industry community to understand it better and to be able to address it. 
Okay, no, that's great, Alex. Thank you. That's very, that's very good. Let's talk about community and connections a bit and how you stay in touch and, and how you build community. I mean, just briefly, Charlie, I mean, just in 30 seconds, what, what do you think are the key things we should be doing to, to build a, a stronger community going forward and to maintain connections? You probably feel a little bit, uh, bit cut off. I'm sure you do. Yeah, um, I mean, I think sessions like this are really helping build connections for people like myself. Um, so one thing that the RTS has offered me is the opportunity to go to specific networking events and be able to network with people within the industry in sectors that I'd like to get into. Um, but I think it's daunting for someone like myself, who's a university student, going to one of those events, like having to practice my approach to go and actually speak to people and build that connection. Is it scary to approach these people who are big names in the industry or very experienced people? Is that the, is that the issue? It's just a bit intimidating. Yeah, yeah. It's like you, you don't want to go up to someone because everyone always says like uh, your first impression matters. You don't want to go up to someone and make a bad first impression so you start to overthink how you're going to approach them and next thing you know, yeah. they're no longer there sessions like this where you're able to ask questions to people within the industry gain even something that's just a name that you can add on linkedin and start communicating that way is something really positive for people in my position especially coming from a low income background where i can't always go to these networking events it's is really valuable it opens up that door and opens up that conversation with people that i was wouldn't be able to speak to yeah, that's interesting. And it may well be, in fact, that this actually levels the playing field a bit because uh, you can, everyone can participate irrespective of whether you can afford train fares and hotels and things. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Thank you for that. Let's talk about productivity and keeping busy, Lisa. I mean, how do you keep yourself uh, mentally uh, fit by being busy and productive and active and, and just doing lots of things? I don't know whether I've ever been this busy in my life before. Oh, you're really busy, been... are you? <laughs> ridiculously busy All right, well, I think good, you know <laughs> so I think um you know that, that, that zoom is is quite challenging in many ways because there's an intensity to it and the way that you communicate with people that can be really quite tough and there's sort of no break in between and, and I've read that you know your ability to read signals from people during conversations is really inhibited by doing it on a screen so it's exhausting spending all of your time I think on on zoom and um, but I do think that this is a this has been an opportunity and is an opportunity for people to think differently and connect differently I think it's a real it is a leveler to Charlie's point you know all of these people that we've had on trains coming down from Glasgow and coming from Wales and coming for meetings and um, now they're all on zoom it doesn't matter where they are and that's that's actually really powerful in and of itself so it's it's a sort of real equalizer i think in the t in the way that we we all communicate with each other um but i but but to your your original point about how we all keep busy um i think that this has been a period that has driven a huge amount of innovation and and i think people have been forced to think differently we're, we're literally are thinking about how you make a television program from the bottom up from scratch on a daily basis and it's different for every single genre and every different program um, and i think that's been actually perversely a really exciting thing for us to have to do and if you look at the results of that i think actually it has really paid dividends i think spring watch looks amazing at the moment but it's been made in a way we would have never have imagined we were going to approach that program you know it's individuals with satellite well, actually, 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 it's great, great activity, creativity can further stimulated that people have had to innovate and had to think of new ways of doing stuff and actually it's all worked very well yeah yeah, yeah very, very incredibly yeah. Yeah, we've yeah. created brilliant television as a result well, that, that's, a, that's a bit of an uptick anyway, some good news in all of this. Let's take some questions now. We're going to go into our final section after the questions, which is about what needs to happen next. So please do think about that. But um, we've had loads and loads of questions. Let me get through a few of them. I'll, I'll ask for quite a uh, brief uh, response if possible. Um, the first one is, um, will all the collaboration that's happened during COVID uh, return? Con sorry. Will all the collaboration that's happened during COVID continue once we return to normal? Um, who'd like to take this one? Uh, Philippa? 
Uh, yes, uh, well, I certainly hope so because it, I think it has. Uh, that has been one of the huge positives, as other people have said, um, coming out of the crisis, is that uh, we've all talked to, together. We've spent hours and hours uh, trying to lobby government on behalf of workers in the industry, and I certainly hope that that the end of this crisis won't be the end of really positive collaboration with lots of people who are who I've met on these screens. Absolutely. Um, next question then, from a broadcaster's perspective, are there any plans to support those who are coming out of university um, and can you help to point in the right direction or advice where we can look? Can I go to um, Kelly Webland for that one? Yeah, so we at Channel 4 we run a, 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 lots of different apprenticeships and training schemes for people at the start of their careers. Unfortunately, due to COVID, the apprenticeship scheme for this year has been paused but the, we have a academy channel for academy which has a huge range of training so i would say get on the website for channel four and you will be able to find out what those opportunities are if i can just go back to one thing that charlie said that i do just want to pick up on which is actually relevant to this question anyway which is that I think the, the point that you made about networking events, Charlie, I think is really key. And, and I, I do think that there has been something about this process. I think what Lisa said about the intensity of Zoom is absolutely right. It is hard and exhausting, but I think we have to question whether expecting young people to sidle up to powerful people at drinks events is actually the right way to help them get into the industry. And I honestly don't think that that's the way that we're going to get an industry that's diverse and representative and young and exciting and vibrant and creative. And that actually there's that, that kind of informality, be, sort of requiring people to do that just does mean that some people are going to be more comfortable than doing that than others and actually this process has meant that people get to speak to people directly where you know what you're coming for you know what you're talking about whether that's through reaching out to someone on linkedin or whether that's through a conversation on zoom uh, and i think we have to have really um honest conversations with ourselves coming out of this that we don't just go back to something um, that, you know, we need to go back to the positives, obviously, by being able to see each other in person, but without losing some of those things. And as Lisa said, we, there's this phrase geo-leveling, but, you know, at Channel 4, we, we've also really noticed the positives for our colleagues who are across the whole country and our suppliers who are across the whole country that suddenly whether you're in London or not is completely irrelevant to the conversation, to who you can see, to how you can see them. Um, but I think for people coming into the industry, we really do have to rethink the way we engage them and the way that we create opportunities for people to, to start their careers. No, fantastic, thank you. And, and look, on the diversity point, Lisa, maybe you could um, comment on that. I mean, do you think there's a risk that diversity will be damaged um, as a result of COVID-19 or maybe the fact that we're going to be using Zoom rather than drinks parties, which are very intimidating, maybe diversity might be improved? I think, you know, given where we are and what has been happening over the last couple of weeks, never has it been more front of mind for us um, as a business to think hard and long about how we um, broaden the makeup of our workforce. Um, it feels really, really important and like it should be our number one priority. So I would hate to feel right now that um, we, we had gone backwards. I think that would be a real tragedy. We have to do more and do better. Um, it's a value we need to hold dear. It's not, you know, a political statement. It's absolutely about our values. So I think we will, we, we need to continue to find ways of ensuring that people can connect with us. And I do think that out of this could come some opportunities to focus and build 
on that because we can connect with people from a from a broader base it isn't about being a london centric networker anymore we do need to think about how we support people throughout our industry we have a tendency to sort of invest in a scheme or a project and then not actually manage all of those connection points across our industry because it is really fragmented because it's full of freelancers and people on contracts if this is an opportunity to think differently about how we engage and employ people and work with people then i think hopefully it will enable us to improve how we can have a more diverse workforce in doing that so i would hope we've got we should be these are two really important things going on at the moment and we should try and bring them together for the benefits um, of our industry well that's a very upbeat note thank you for that one more question we're going to go into our last session and this is this uh, this question, what can the industry do to ensure we work reasonable hours and are able to have family lives and that there are boundaries at work regarding hours and social and alcohol expectations? Uh, maybe I can put that to you, Philippa, from back to. I like the alcohol expectations bit. Maybe we'll all have a drink after this, but uh, what, 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 what's your answer to that question? So I do think um, that that's a huge part of um, some of the things that Alex talked about earlier. Quite clearly, um, control around your working hours and being able to do things with your family that, that, uh, or, or, or your parents or whoever um, are really important, I think. Uh, uh, the things that we take for granted as employees, being able to, to take time off to go to um, a school concert or something. Um, I think these things are really crucial and again I'm not saying the solutions are easy but I think the industry needs to start thinking a bit outside the box in terms of how you how you um, can you know think about job sharing or think about flexible working um, and allowing people to have you know a good balance between their work life and their home life. Okay, let's move to um, the last section then, which is about what needs to happen next. And uh, just going back to Alex's slide on that um, really good slide, the last one, supporting people through the crisis, she had the different stages, one, two, three, and four. And we're sort of at stage two, coming out of stage two, surviving and optimizing, coming into stage three, recovery. Um, staying with you, um, Philip, we're in stage three. What are the key things we can do to uh, support freelancers and particularly sure that um, as we do recover this hardship doesn't happen again yeah so we've been talking about talking to our members about something that we've described as a new deal for freelancers which i sort of alluded to a little bit earlier and as i said we're not in a in a space where we can say you know these are the 10 things that we think the industry needs to do but we definitely have been having that dialogue with members, uh, uh, members and, and people who aren't members actually, because there are lots of um, groups that have, uh, networks that have popped up during this period or have grown during this period, uh, where people have been talking about the things that they, they want to change about the industry. So um, I think a, an ongoing discussion that we don't just you know, return to things as they were be before the crisis, that we do all think about what changes we can make that will make uh, freelancers' lives better and then feel better about the industry that they work in and um, you know, are more productive as a result, quite frankly. Kelly, let me turn to you. You talked earlier about uh, Channel 4. Uh, needing to continue commissioning and, and making programs was the priority and doing so at lower tariffs if you do that do you, do you think you can keep the same number of people in you're going to make effectively uh, for a lower budget you're going to make more programs at a lower price per program is that a realistic possibility to keep the the level of freelance um, number of people in the freelance business at 100k as it is now um well I'm hoping it's not only Channel 4 that's going not to be... Not just Channel 4 doing the whole thing, but it's part um, of it. Um, look, our, I, I think the most important thing right now, and which is what I've spent, you know, the last two weeks doing uh, primarily, is that we need to get back to work. And we need to work out how we can um, make a proper full range of different types of shows um, starting as soon as possible 
to ensure that we can get people back to work across the industry. So from scripted to unscripted, um, from fast turnaround shows to, to big reality shows, um, make working together on protocols and on ways of getting back to work is the most important thing that we can do right now. And that is what we are doing. And certainly what I feel hopeful about is that none of us know what's going to happen with coronavirus, but I do feel that we, we are certainly working on the basis that the, the, the protocols that we're using um, for the shows that we're hoping will either start in production or restart in production uh, in the rest of this year will be robust enough to continue whatever happens with the virus so that we don't end up having to stop everything again. And I think that one of the things that we should feel positive about is that when um, this crisis hit, we were all on the back foot um, and we've had to learn an enormous amount to the point where we are now on the front foot. And that is a good thing. So we have worked out how to start to get the industry up and running again and how to keep it up and running um, no matter what happens. In terms of tariffs, you know, we still have the same number of hours on telly um, and we are working out how to uh, fill our schedule with a significantly lower budget this year. Um, and that means that we've got to box and cox in all kinds of ways. Uh, but, you know, we are doing everything we possibly can to continue to commission and to continue fund development and to support um, freelancers in that way. Okay, fantastic. We've got an overrun, by the way, of five to ten minutes, so don't go away. We're going to run till about ten past, so uh, it's been such a great discussion. Charlie, um, from you, um, what's the one thing you'd like to see for the future? So obviously, I know you're looking forward to your results on the 1st of July, and we send you our, our best for a great result, but what's the one thing you'd like apart from great results? Um, for me personally, I think I speak for a lot of people in my position, it is more knowledge about what happens next for us um i know a lot of people coming out of university are terrified of the thought of freelancing and now have been put off it completely because of covid and because of seeing what's happened to freelancers in the industry during this time a lot more people are looking for staff jobs but a lot of people don't have well from from my perspective anyway a lot of people don't have the correct knowledge about freelancing about how to get into it about how to gain a job in the industry being a freelancer so i think um more information and more conversations with industry experts i, I mean i completely agree with what lisa's been saying about and everyone else really about this and zoom being a really valuable tool for breaking that wall and being able to speak with people within the industry and not be so intimidated by the by that aspect okay. um that's great note we'll, we'll all try and do that i think that's a really really important note and, and very valuable thank you and um, we've got one question to get in before we go i've got a couple of minutes left um and the question is don't you think that making a role of mental health first aider as a mandatory role in the industry will be a huge help to support cast and crew it will only happen if those with budget control put it in uh, as a priority as part of their budgets um lisa what do you think of that idea we have we have quite a lot of mental health first aiders and i think it's and it's something we support absolutely and i think it would be a really really good thing to, to to see more of um it's already a part of what we focus on i think um you know the the, the calling it out the recognizing it the identifying it it's with you know is really really important so i support that fantastic thank you that's a big vote of confidence from the bbc alex same point yeah, I just wanted to add, because I think it's really important to understand that there is a business case for looking after people's mental health. So when we talk about budget lines, this isn't a cost. There was some research that was done by Deloitte looking at the looking at the investment case for mental health. And they did it for the first time a couple of years ago. They republished it in January of this year, and they found that there is a five pound return for every one pound you invest in mental health. So I think the industry um, you know, it's, it's absolutely coming to recognise the value of those investments in mental health. And I think it's 
it feels more important than ever now because of course budgets you know budgets will be constrained and i think you know the one thing that i feel i feel very passionately about is that that cannot be at the expense of the welfare of our people in fact that should be sort of at the top of the list of, of the things that we look at to, to to keep there in those budgets okay fantastic wise words um let me come to you philippa we've talked a lot about um, the future and we've talked a lot about cross um, party collaboration and discussion and working together. What are the other things that you'd like to see for the future? What have we not mentioned that you think is really important that we ought to be thinking about for the, uh, the mental and, um, and financial well-being of all of our freelancers in the UK? Um, I don't know if it's an, uh, a new thing, but I definitely think that, you know, um, we have to put some momentum into this um, this challenge around mental health because um, it will impact on every almost everyone as, as we've heard from Alex at some point during their their career and I think it's really isolating particularly if you're a freelancer and you feel that you're alone uh, dealing with a problem like this so um, I I think we you know this is this is key to so many things and could be so productive for, for the industry if um they if we all put some focus onto this and make sure that uh, we're not just talking about it but we're making real change and we're calling out and we're supporting um the workforce when they say that these things are going on that's a fantastic point at which to end um let me um say thank you very much to you uh, to all of our panelists to alex from the film and tv charity to lisa from bbc studios philippa from back to uh, Kelly from Channel 4. Charlie, good luck with the results. We'll be rooting for you. Let us know how you get on, my friend, on the 1st of July. Uh, this has been a discussion organised by the RTS with the Film and TV charity together. I'm sure there'll be a lot more uh, such sessions. This has been incredibly illuminating for me too. I, I've learned a lot and I think uh, it's something we all need to make sure is absolutely uppermost in our minds as we go about our daily jobs. Thank you very much too for your excellent questions. Um, sorry if we couldn't get to yours, but thank you for the questions. Um, I hope you found it valuable and let's keep the debate going and let's move forward. But uh, a wonderful hour and 10 minutes. Thank you all very much indeed.